in the Marine Corps, even, even as a major, which is what I separated as, you're, you're always working for somebody. And sometimes you feel like a horse that just wants to run. And I always felt like that. I just wanted to run. I wanted to exercise my full capacity. And then on the other hand, I think I saw the adventure in it. I'd kind of come out of a world that was very adventurous. And I thought in entrepreneurism, you can kind of pave your own way. Are you looking to improve your sales skills without compromising your values? Welcome to Sales Made Easy, a podcast for business and personal growth. Now, here's your host, Harry. Our guest today is Eric Martindale, coming out of the great city of brotherly love in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Eric is the CEO of a company called Elite Commerce Group, which has been around for a little over 10 years, I think coming up on 12 right now. So Eric, welcome to the Sales Made Easy podcast, sir. What's the good word? Yeah, Harry, thank you for having me. Yeah, this is gonna be great, Eric. So can you give us a little background as to what it is you do in serving uh, humanity with business these days? Sure. We are a full spectrum digital commerce agency. We focus to the various digital marketplaces like Amazon, Walmart.com, Chewy, Target, TikTok Shop. That's one of the, the hotter ones. Recently, we do everything from SEO to digital advertising to there's a, a warehouse behind that wall. We do order fulfillment and Amazon FBA prep, and we even do some limited ERPs. We have a development team. So if it has to do with marketplace selling, we do it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So you've got quite a bunch of stuff going on. And my first question is, did you start with all of that or were you a little more focused as they say, know your niche and blah, blah, blah. How did you start out? What was your thought when you did? It, it has been a wild, convoluted ride, but I spent most of my adult life as a Marine officer. So I, said I spent almost 20 years in the Marine Corps on active duty, and I ended up getting assigned to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and that was kind of home for me. It was real close to home, so I knew I was going to get out from there. When I got there, working at a university, I went from deployments and training and, you know, disappearing for different training events to actually being stable and working for the most part, Monday through Friday. So I started a business on the side and I won't bore you with the details, but long story short, I got involved with a contract in a contract from a, with a company out of Australia. And I had to move a certain amount of product, ran into trouble, turned to Amazon and was kind of taken aback by how successful it was. Now, it was way back in 2009. So the long and the short of it is I, you know, ended up going from Amazon to then walmart.com, then Target, and now we're on 26 different electronic marketplaces. Oh, amazing. So first of all, uh, thank you for your service in defending uh, the great country, United States of America. And were you just out of curiosity, were you in the Marines during 9-11 already, or did you sign up right after or what? I was at that time, I was actually in the reserves and okay. I, I went active duty immediately after. So that was, that was the thing that kind of kicked me in the butt. And, uh, I ended up going at active duty because of that event. Okay, great. Yes. Well, we appreciate that. So as far as you're getting your business started, you, you, you looked into Amazon. I, I don't even remember what Amazon was doing in 2009, but time does fly. I think that they must have been beyond selling books they at were, that point. They were. It wasn't the monster it is today. Uh, actually, I used at the time Amazon and eBay. eBay's, okay. you know, a, a shadow of its former self, but Amazon was, it, it was alive and well. It was beyond books. There were other categories just not quite as prolific as it is today. Mm, great. So going into your, into your business experience, did you think of yourself as running your own business when you were leaving the Marines? Because it looks like you were doing some, doing some work as a professor as well at Villanova. If, 
So it looks, you know, like you had a few different things going on, but did you see yourself as, you know, an entrepreneur at that time? I did. And, and that word is, is really what resonated with me. I, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, I didn't, didn't really see in my mind's eye how it was going to go or what exactly was going to evolve, but I, I did want to be in business. That was, that was the goal. Okay. Yeah. And what was the driving factor for you as far as being an entrepreneur? What did you love about the idea? I think there were two things. Number one, you know, in the Marine Corps, even as a, a major, which is what I separated as, you're, you're always working for somebody. And sometimes you feel like, like a horse that just wants to run. And I always felt like that. I just wanted to run. I wanted to, you know, exercise my full capacity. And then on the other hand, I think I saw the adventure in it and the, you know, I, I'd kind of come out of a world that was very adventurous. And I thought, you know, in entrepreneurism, you can kind of pave your own way. And it, it has definitely given me both of those things over the years. And what would you say, Eric, I'm sure uh, you've got tons of stories, but what jumped out at you maybe in the beginning when you were just starting out, were there any surprises about the venture that you were getting into? Well, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I, I think there, there were some things that the military set me up well for, or some ways in which it, it set me up well in terms of discipline and some of the character traits that you, you walk away from. But there, I certainly forfeited some of the experience that I didn't get from the corporate world, some of the systems and things like that. So I, I kind of had to figure everything out myself. I had no mentors. I, you go from the Marine Corps where you're in an environment of consummate mentorship. You are always a mentor to multiple people and you always have usually multiple mentors. And I, I stepped out into business and I knew no one. I had no network, no mentor. Wow. Yeah, as you're describing that, I'm just thinking what that adjustment must have been like, you know, being around a team constantly and giving orders and being given orders. So there's, yeah. So how did you make this adjustment? It sounds incredible, really. It was very difficult. And I think inherent to that, you, especially in the Marine Corps, you end up relying on systems and learning to appreciate systems and be honest to systems. And then going into full-time business, none of those, you, you go from 200 year old systems to no systems unless you create it yourself. So it, it was definitely an adjustment and I had to work really hard to build a network, which was a professional network, which was a, a, you know, a system of trial and error over, over a few years. Uh, and then ultimately kind of fit into a network where I was just, just thirsty for, you know, learning, just l learning the basic things uh, uh, about business. I did have an MBA, so it wasn't like I didn't understand branding or marketing, but I didn't understand, you know, how successful corporations were set up because I'd never been in one. Right. Yeah. Incredible. So did you find like a mentor or a North star to help out in the beginning or what was that like? I, I did. And, you know, as you asked that question, I, I look back and I wonder if this gentleman even knows that, that I looked at him that way. Uh, but I did, I did encounter uh, an individual in that group. I ended up in a, a tight group where we would go and we would go to, we would attend the same trade shows. Uh, professional development conferences, things like that. And there was a group of maybe seven of us. And there was one individual in that group where he had the same size business, business I did by the time I encountered him, although his is much larger now. It's, it's merged twice with other businesses. It's, it's, it, he's had investment by a VC firm. Mm -hmm. But at the time, he came through corporate America yeah. And he had tons of different experiences in business. So when, when he spoke, I listened and, I, and there were a couple of instances where, you know, I, I'd see him maybe four or five times a year. And there were a couple of instances where I, I did call him and say, his name was Tom, Tom, I, I need help. I have this problem. 
what would you do here? And he never failed to give me incredible advice. Wow. Yeah, that's great. So what, what do you gain? What did you gain from that experience that you're just sharing with us now? And how does that, how would you advise someone else who's getting started today with that in mind? I tend, I tend to lead with relationships now. So there are in business, if you're growing, you, you're, you're always in the process of developing something. Uh, you're, you're developing a new stream of revenue, new accounts, things like that. And I, I lead now with relationships. I realize how important they are. I have, I, even right now, I'm, I'm recently involved with yet another networking group and uh, honestly trying to give as much as possible. I think in, in the, the, that first professional network, I, I was trying to figure out what I could get, what I could learn. And I learned over time to, to give first, to look for opportunities to say, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Maybe you can use this. And I think you end up with much, much stronger relationships when you do that. Yeah. It's really incredible. I, the light bulb still goes on periodically for me. Does it for you? Is that when you catch yourself, it's like, maybe you're in a foul mood or you got other things you're preoccupied. But when you start thinking about how can I give to somebody here, you're probably like me. It just changes your whole demeanor and say, I'm going to make someone's, my day may not be the greatest right now, but I'm going to help someone else's day. Uh, and I think that's just a huge benefit when you realize the value that you can offer. So thoughts? I agree. I didn't think about it from that angle. If the relationship is symbiotic and it should be, you have to be providing something. So when you set out to network by creating relationships, it can't just be, I'm going to go see what I can get, or I'm going to see what relationships I can create to get done what I need to get done. It, it has to be that you're providing something to those people. But I even really didn't think about that, that what you just mentioned is a lesson. I, I, I think I have to learn over and over and over again, you know, getting outside of yourself and focusing on other, other people can can change the, the entire dynamic of you know, your day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you think about networking and it's just, it's incredible how many people do it wrong. I'm not, I'm not the, I'm not the expert. I had a guy on the podcast when this airs, the podcast was early October with Daniel Andrews. That guy knows how to, he, he doesn't refer to it as networking. He talks about having a network, people mm. that are in your phone that you can call, you can talk shop, provide value for each other, and they're going to answer when you call versus <clears throat> when you show up at a network event and you try to sell somebody right. and most people, you don't know them, they're yeah. asking for referrals and you're not going to give one of your top clients to someone you don't know. So Think through that, people, is that build great relationships, which you said earlier, is that you lead with relationships. So great stuff. Eric, switching gears a little bit, you and I have a, we're, we're both fans to some degree of Gary V. Mm. And I was recently on a podcast and someone asked me a question about Am selling on Amazon. And I, it was one of those moments where I had to admit, I said, I'm not that guy on a live show. So I had a little humble pie and I, you know, I told him straight up, I said, I'm not really that guy. And they said, well, you must have an opinion. I said, of course. I said, today in sales, people lead with product mm. and it's all about the product, but they're not necessarily selling what the end result is with the product. Right. So you see an air conditioner on sale. You would think you would hear something about keeping your house cool, not our air conditioner is the best. And right. this, this is happening over and over again in sales. And you and I were speaking earlier about the world of selling digitally versus the people. Right. So I want to understand a little bit more what goes on in the digital world of sales. Um, and so. I'm going to give you the floor as to what would you say is the main difference that you've picked up versus the relationship? Wow. The, 
I, I would say the main, that, that is such a, a good question. I think the main difference is when selling to people, we, you know, we've been talking about relationships and I, I still, the way that, that we sell it, it gets that pendulum swings further and further toward creating a relationship and the sale will come when it makes sense and, and having a quiver full of those relationships. We talk about lead, lead funnels and lead pipelines. Well, you can, you can send me a hundred leads a week, or I can have a thousand relationships that I've been cultivating. I I'll take the relationships I've been cultivating mm -hmm. and those are going to, there's going to be a constant flow of sales that materialize when the time is right for them until you build a brand. So there is some brand building. It is, it is less relational in terms of whoever is selling or the founder uh, or, or, or whoever, but you have to, the difference between selling the, the two different ways is digitally, you have to sell to the emotions. You have to present something to somebody that is going to make them hungry enough to make a sale or you see some kind of a happiness or efficiency in their life to the extent where they're ready to make a sale because there, there really isn't that interpersonal relationship. So I would say that that's the primary difference between selling in those two ways. So you're really talking about the brand and it's, it's like, it's almost in the beginning, it's too early to even, for someone to even know what the brand represents, right? Right. And I, I would say a lot of the accounts that we start with, even, even some, some, some pretty large companies, their brand is not even really defined that well. Mm. So you, you have to be able to convince the customer to buy by appealing to their emotions, that, that emotional end state, you know, you talked about the air conditioner versus how does it feel in that room? You have to, let's say you're selling a food product. You have to make their mouth water without having ever experienced that product before. Once you have a brand, it's a, it's a little bit different and you, you know, you can remarket and you know, the customer knows what they can expect from your brand, but. Yeah, it, it is, it is a little bit more transactional, like I mm -hmm. said, than yeah. person to person. Well, I, yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things is not that I do this a lot, but I like to shop stuff that's made in America. I do too. And when you do that, you, you, you come across these websites and so forth where you have these very small businesses that you know, the price is higher, then you have to make the decision. All right, how much do I want to shop made in America? And we all have those decisions to make. In those businesses, their brand is the reason I buy, I would want to buy, not that I always do, right? So they're telling their why, they're, you know, proud Americans, they want businesses to flourish here in the States versus everything being shipped overseas. So you can get that story a little bit. But from what I'm hearing, that, that may be unique in that kind of niche, niche, niche. What's your thought on that? Am I thinking too much on that? No, I, I think that's important. And I think it varies by demographic as well. So you or, you or I prefer to shop a brand. Um, I just read this morning that Gen Z is 75% more likely to shop by sustainability mm. than they are according to brand loyalty. Wow. That's one, that's one factor there, but 75% is a pretty, pretty large margin. I'd say I, I don't want to, I don't want to project for you, but I'm, I'm more likely to say I like this brand and I maybe I already know those brand attributes, maybe how sustainable it is or how much they give back to the community or whatever. Right. But I do tend to go back to the same brands like you. I, I would be considered a brand loyalist, I think. Mm. But younger generations are not necessarily that way. Yeah, it's really good. Okay, so we were talking about Gary V earlier. I mentioned him. And I'm a big fan of just providing value. We were talking, like some friends of mine, myself, we're talking about, well, calls to action. Do you really need calls to action? And some will have calls to action in everything they do. I do a lot of video over the past few months and I have a call to action in everything, which is a complete 
shift in my thinking, but I've provided value for years and now I'm having fun with a call to action. So it's kind of a tongue in cheek type thing, but it fits my personality. I'm telling you all of this because some people overdo the calls to action and some people don't do it enough. And you kind of come up with a system that seems to be working. And I wanted to hear what it is that you're doing with the use of vid video and marketing and so forth. Yeah. Well, I, I also do a call to action. So I know, I know what I'm about to describe here is not, um, I'm not leading with the call to action, but I do, I have some kind of a call to action. It might just be follow me, you know, yeah. it, if it's a LinkedIn post or a video, or I, I do ask for likes and things like that. But I think that the, the difference is what's the purpose of this thing that I'm sending out. Right. What we started doing a couple of months ago is we really sort of synergize the different marketing and selling activities into really a single pipeline. And the way it works is this, and I'll, I'll be very specific if, if you'll permit me to mm -hmm. be, but we'll take a theme <clears throat> and we won't market or sell outside of that theme for the most part. There are little odds and ends here or there that make sense. But we, let's say we, we started with a new marketplace and um, I'll give you an example, Instacart. It's been in the news lately. They just IPO'd. We started working with Instacart this summer and we would send out a, we would start with a YouTube video and it would just be, here's, here's what Instacart can do for you. Here's how you set it up. Go nuts. And it's just value. Then we would go to the email list and we'd send that video out on the email list and maybe some more actionable steps here. This is what you can do. Here's some facts. Here's some steps you can take. And then we would do the same thing on LinkedIn. We'd chop the video up. We'd send other pieces of content all related around the same theme, just free content. Here's what you can do. Here's how it will value your business. And then after all of that is said and done, we have a campaign of about two weeks all around the same product. What we do, we'll send out an email that says we provide Instacart support. Schedule a, a time on my calendar. That's, that's our sell. So all of the other stuff over the, those two weeks is it's kind of just here you go for free. Here you go for free. Here's some, some more value, more value, more value. And then when we go out and we actually sell the thing, we're going to get the, the, the people that don't want to run it themselves. If somebody wants to do it themselves, they're going to do it themselves. If they don't, then we're, we're there to support. And it's been very effective. It's been really good. I love it. Okay. So a couple of thoughts come to mind. Number one would be giving away content that some people think this is their secret. It's like their secret sauce. Do you feel that way as far as giving away these ideas? Do, do I feel that way? Technically, yes. It is, it is a hard, it is a hard mindset to get around at first. And yep. then it's, I think you always wrestle with it. And I, I don't know that we want to give away trade secrets. Right. Of course. Yeah. That's right. I agree. Coca-Cola is not giving away but, here are my 17 herbs and spices. Right. I, I think I, well, it, we have to make the distinction over who is and who is not our customer. And if somebody is our customer, they don't want to do the thing. Mm. If somebody's not our customer, they were never going to be our customer. Yeah. So I, I think that providing that free value is is something that we have to work through. We have to get our, 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 our mindset right and and we just have to do it. If you don't give away value, people are not going to follow you and they're not going to read what you said. Right. Well, in fact, I look at it as they'll go somewhere else. Right. Right. And then, so you, it's a double loss, right? Not only are they not following you, they're following someone else and you can watch their businesses thrive. That's right. Yeah. I, right. So I totally agree on the trade secrets. If you've got some secret sauce that I'm not saying that, but if you're, giving ideas as to how to market and something that anyone can Google and go to find a YouTube video. If it's on YouTube, it's not a secret anymore. Right. Right. And so I look at it as when I hear people say that I say, well, wouldn't you rather have followers of 
potential buyers, and then the people who are not necessarily going to buy from you, couldn't they possibly tell some of their friends where they're getting content from that gets you another follower of someone who may buy from you? What's your thought about that whole concept? You know, will you, will you lose some people? Will you, will you teach some competitors? I think the answer is yes. And, and some of that boils down to, are, are we constantly growing and raising the bar? If, if we are, then people aren't really going to be able to execute the same way as us. And if you're talking about a potential client or a prospect and you're a professional and this is the thing that you do, they're, they're not going to execute it or they're not going to fulfill it as well as, as you could anyway. So I think that, is there a little bit of risk there or is there a little bit of bleed? Yes, maybe. But again, you're, you're not going to be creating relationships. Every single thing is going to be a transactional sell. It's going to be new to new people. You're constantly going to have to rotate your email list. We, we very seldom rotate our email list. It is very active. We have a very high open rate because it's mostly value. It's mostly value based. And we get, I'll run it, I'll go to, to the same trade shows that my, you know, our prospect list goes to and people recognize me, they stop me, they ask questions. So you're, you're building a relationship, not just hammering a cold email list over and over and over. I, I always say our email list is a hot list. It, mm -hmm. it, it just is. So <clears throat> like all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's phenomenal. What are your expectations? As far as, I mean, is there a percentage of emails that you expect to be open? Is there, is there a percentage of your list that you've grown to expect that people buy? And I'm not saying this in a presumptuous manner, but just looking at the data, does that tell you that you can kind of plan the following year based on the data from the past and so forth? I think somewhat. So open rates, we, we do follow open rates for sure. We have, we have experimented, you know, we've done the homework. We've experimented on time of day. We've experimented on day per day of week. We've experimented on the value-based email versus the, the, the hard call to action email. And, you know, in terms of time or day of the week, we know our open rates, we look at those, but Every product is different. So we're not selling the exact same thing over and over again. And I would say, unless you are, you can expect a different, different response based on a product. So let's say we, we are, we are an agency and we could be selling a monthly service or we could be selling a one-time console. Those are going to convert differently. We, we actually have a lot of different products and we're constantly developing new ones. So sometimes we're surprised and the open rate is higher than we thought and the conversion rate is higher or lower than we thought. But it, it, there is, we do, I, th I would say we do need to understand the numbers. We need to be evaluating. We need to be testing. And I think you can make, some, at least if you do that, you can make some sort of a projection in terms of growth. Yeah, that's right. How often do you think a list should be emailed? What comes to mind for you? Oh, that's such a great question. I, lo I love that question because I think it depends on how you're using that list. And I, I, I was kind of bragging about our, our list and saying it's a hot list, but we, we're very intentional about literally giving things away. So I'll give you an example. Amazon released a new feature where you, you can, I won't bore you with it, but you can go into your seller account. And you can put in a couple of numbers, a percentage of discounts and click OK. And Amazon will start retargeting certain groups of customers. Okay. Now, I could have sold that. I could have used that to sell or I could have said, no, this is mine. I can't let this get out because it's a secret. But instead, we just sent out a tutorial. Hey, this is three steps. You don't need me. And we sent it out. So that, that list, we, we try to do that as much as possible. We, we just sent out to our full list, our Q4 e-commerce strategy guide. These are the five steps we take with our client accounts. Here you go. If you can do them, great. And mm -hmm. because of that, I think we can get away with a few more emails. But 
I think that if you're using, you know, volume over quantity and you're not nurturing that list, you've got to be very careful and you, you don't want to send it out too much. Okay. So you're not going to give me a straight answer. Well, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, Eric. 100% humor answer. Are you asking how often we hit our list? No, no, no. It's okay. I was just completely playing because your answer makes sense is that it really comes down to providing value. Yeah. And, you know, if you've got some things that you're providing value versus spamming, I'm not going to judge, but when I feel spam, it's like, there's no value. There's, you know, right. There's not enough value if I'm unsubscribing. So you have to play, you have to kind of figure it out. It's like, if you're seeing people unsubscribing, I want to check the value that you're offering would right. be one thing, right? And just uh, kind of look at, okay, what's the testing? What am I doing? So forth. What's your thought on that? And I uh, forgive me for being a wise acre. No, no. I, so I, I think it depends on how you target as well. And, you know, what kind of product you have and how specific you can, you can get to your prospect list. But if you were to go into sales navigator and you were to pull down a hundred thousand emails, you're not going to be very specific and you're going to have a really high, you're going to send a, a lot of people are going to send you to, to junk and they're going mm. to block you. If you're very, very specific and you're very targeted, you, and you know exactly what this customer wants and what will help them out, you're going to have a very warm list and you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to hit it more often because you're not hitting it to sell. Most of the time you're hitting it to give little things away for free. So I just think there's a difference in terms of how you first, how you target, and then second, how you nurture that list. The, the list doesn't get sold to most of the time. I think the list mm -hmm. is nurtured most of the time. Yeah. That's so, great. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, that, that was, that was it. Nur you nurture and serve. And then you, you slide in the sale when it makes sense. And you, 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 you that, that list will be ready to buy. Beautiful. Like selling with dignity. I just love the approach. <laughs> Your, I mean, you, you really were very much in tune and aligned through this. Did you, when you got started in business, did you ever think that you would become like a salesperson was the thought of being a salesperson. Was that foreign to you or did you know what you were getting into? I, I bombed it for a long time and I am still learning a lot. I, I, I don't want to come across as a, you know, lifetime sales professional like you. I, I I've learned some things and, you know, continue to learn others and I have a lot of room to grow. But in the beginning, I really bombed. I had no idea what I was doing when I first started selling. I'd never read a book on sales, really, or I read one, one book. It just, it said there are three types of personalities that sell and they're all valid. To be honest with you, one of those personalities I firmly disagree with, and I think you would too, they called it, I believe the pit bull. Mm. And I cannot stand being sold to by a pit bull. I, that's the, the first person I want to hang up the phone on that per that hard sell that right so we're going to do this thing or what you know i do not respond well to that i don't yeah. think anybody should sell that way but people do right so just it just was not a helpful yeah i mean the, the whole pitfall just getting past the no and not being offended that's okay but then when you're invading the space and you become obnoxious and a couple of, no, I'm not interested. You don't get the hint. First time I get people trying to overcome that because everyone says, it's sort of like when you go to a store, you know, someone says, well, what can I help you? you? Say, no, I'm all set. Well, the first response is, you know, it's programmed in us. But then the second one is if they ask, well, what brought you in here? And you say, I'm all set. They should get the hint. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, whatever, some, quite a few in sales feel like they need to keep pushing because they're always closing. And in a, in a business where you care about the people, it's about repeat business, it's customers for life, you can't act that way because you're going to drive people away. And even the people that buy from you will never want to talk to you again 
Right. And I had to buy it from somebody, and you were the least painful of the three choices. It's not a great a recommendation. So, I, you know, and I think you know we all we all get these these cold emails where I, we don't we don't cold email. You know, it, we gradually add people to our list if and and we have a way of doing that. But how many emails do you get a day where somebody says? Hey, I was looking up your website online and saw you ranked at the top of Google and or at your top something website. And I thought, first of all, we're not ranked at the top of Google. So I already know it's it's not true. And I thought I we really should partner. Well, I don't know who you are. The chances I'm gonna partner with with somebody through a cold email is pretty close to zero. I don't know this person. I don't know what they're about. I don't know what the company is about. If I have to take a company out of an email, the, you know, the bot, a signature block and put it into Google, the answer is going to be close to 100% no. I think that creating that relationship, even when it is over email, is really important first. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a great point. So what would you do differently? Like, say you have a new subscriber. What do they feel differently than the, hey, Eric, I noticed that uh, exploring your website that your SEO is terrible. Uh, let's set up a meeting and uh, whatever, right? So what are your email list people experiencing that's different? It, it is a really a, instead of saying, hey, your SEO is off, it is more like here's a new tool that came out. And it can give you your analytics in, you know, the, by, by entering your link or something like that. I don't, we don't do website. Right. So. Right. But yeah, I, I love how you're playing with this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're bailing me out. No, no. I, I think, you know, it's, it's knowing that list. It's not, a, if you have a list of a hundred thousand people and it works for you, fine. It, it's not how we've right. done it, but. If you have that list of 100,000 people, it's going to get really hard to provide something that's of con consistent value across that list. So it maybe you sell insurance or something like that, personal insurance, that may be a little bit different. But if you're selling business services, especially, or you're selling products and you know who is in that list and you know what they need and want, then that first email for me is... Hey, here's a thing you can do it yourself, or it's going to provide you this value and that's it. Maybe yeah. follow us or see more, you know, at our visit us or our website, right. if you want to know more at the bottom, but it's not, there's, there's no hard sell in there. Mm. That's really good. I love the subtle calls to action. Follow me. Mm. Our information is blown. It's just great. What am I missing, Eric? Do you have any advice for our listeners, for the people who are starting their entrepreneurial journey? What comes to mind for you? I, I think you asked in the beginning, what is, what's the difference between digital selling and the, the more conventional form of selling? And I think that if you, if you start there, there's, there's something, we use a digital free, I'm sorry, a growth framework in, in digital selling and e-commerce. And you don't have to fully understand this, but it's essentially impressions. So the people seeing your product times your click-through rate, times your conversion rate, times your offer price equals your sales. Yeah. If you know what that formula is, then you know you only have to increase one of those to increase your sales. I think in more traditional selling, you can, the formula is even more simple. It's the number of offers you make times your closing rate times your offer price. And if you want to make more money, you have to increase one of those. You can increase the number of offers you make. You can increase your effectiveness and the, the rate at which you close, or you can raise your, your price. The first two involves you getting better. And the last one you pass the cost on to your customers. So. My recommendation is if you're early on, you figure out the first two, you figure out how to make more offers or you figure out how to close better. And that's how you lift your sales. Mm -hmm. and you have, but you have to do one of those three. There's right. no. And I would just add is speak to your ideal client. 
Mm. Making offers to people who are not a fit is a waste of everybody's time. Having conversations with somebody who is completely not a fit and thinking that you're helping yourself by getting through another no to get to a yes, which is this archaic thinking. It's all about speaking to the right people in that conversation that you're talking about. And then if, they're, if they say no today, it doesn't mean they're no forever because they're, there's a good chance they might need what you're selling down the road, right? So anyway, that would be the only thing I would add to it. But I think that I love the framework. It's just, it's just, I love the fact that you have these systems down and framework, which is a lot of what people in sales need. So yeah, I agree. I, I know I needed them. Great stuff, Eric. So where can people find more of you, sir? You can find me on LinkedIn. You just search for Eric Martindale. You can find me on YouTube. You can search for Eric Martindale or Elite Commerce Group, or you can find us at EliteCommerceGroup.com. Excellent. And we'll make sure all of that will be in the show notes. So Eric, this has been a blast One you. for your service and for your contribution here on the Sales Made Easy podcast. Thank you for listening to Sales Made Easy. Thank you for listening to Sales Made Easy. If you found value in our conversations, please subscribe and leave a review. Our goal is to provide practical strategies for growing your business while staying true to your values. Remember, success in sales is about serving your clients. Serve first and the selling will follow. We'll be back soon with more insights and inspiration. Until then, keep serving and providing value to others. Good things will happen.